Welcome back yet again. Uh, today we're going to talk about political economy. We'll talk about the economy of Central Asia, um, and we'll explain the low level, of, low level of economic development in Central Asia and the role of cotton in Central Asia's economy. And these two things are actually quite closely connected. You'll probably learn a lot more about cotton than you ever wanted to, uh, but it's important to understanding Central Asia. And finally, we talk about uh, some problems in Central Asia's economic transition. So it's important to remember as we go through this that to bring Central Asia's proportion of national income per person to the overall Soviet level, its population would have had to fall by about half. It was severely underfunded compared to, or underdeveloped compared to the rest of the Soviet Union. Now, there are several reasons for why it was it had such a low level of development. And the Soviet, typical Soviet response was the Soviets liked to blame uh, three things. One, a legacy of economic backwardness from the pre-Soviet days. So it wasn't their fault. This was the, the consequence of czarism. Uh, two, uh, high rates of population growth. So um, this made this into much more of a, a demographic and especially a cultural issue, um, the, high, the high amount of birth rates. <clears throat> and finally, uh, three, traditionalism. Lots of people were, were not working in the public sector, women in particular, uh, and, and this, kept the, this kept the level of development low. <clears throat> so these were three of the big explanations. Now, in fact, it's much more been about investment than any of these things. Moscow, when, during the Soviet period, was afraid that a balanced economy would serve as a basis for greater political autonomy. And so it enforced specialization of the type that we've discussed before. So each republic would do something different, even for a given factory. Um, things would be the inputs for whatever the factory was producing would be created in different areas. This was everywhere around the Soviet Union. But the Central Asians got arguably the worst deal of all because they were specializing in a raw material that would quickly destroy their environment and also lead to a dependency for basic goods, including food, on Moscow. And finally, it would lead to the deterioration of the health and educational positions of their people. Uh, in terms of health, the, the, the cotton, well, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the cotton economy basically sapped up people's health by um, creating environmental problems, um, the salinization of, of the land, um, and educational, educationally, Central Asians historically didn't go to school for many, many months when they were involved in collecting agriculture. In other words, Central Asian school children were taken out. And this is something that continues to go on today, this forced labor. <clears throat> now, the, the fact that Central Asia produced raw materials while other regions produced finished products, consumer goods which have much greater value, in large part accounted for the disparity in the proportion of regional population to national income that I mentioned a couple seconds ago. So what was Moscow's plan? Well, <clears throat> what you had historically uh, in terms was, was investment that, was, that went into the region that was directed entirely by Moscow. As in all the other parts of the, of the Soviet Union, Central Asia's economies were all treated as one, though. There was an economic council for all of them, the Ministry of Construction in Central Asia, um, GOSPLAN, uh, the, the, that means the State Planning Committee. Um, it was responsible for planning the entire economy. It was allocated, uh, allocated to Central Asia <clears throat> one segment, okay? And only later did it divide um, Central Asia into various states. But for, for the most part, they were, they were one big chunk when GOSPLAN was coming up with, with its program for the region. Development in Central Asia is highly skewed. Central Asia's share of industrial investment was the lowest level of all the regions. Central Asia's share of agricultural investment was the highest of all the regions of the Soviet Union. The level of investment in Central Asia stayed relatively unchanged from the 1960s through to the 1980s. But to make matters worse, in the early 1980s, Central Asia began to get, began to get less growth in investment than did other regions. So for example, in this period, in the early 1980s, there was a, about a 19% increase in investment in general, much higher in the Baltics, the, the wealthiest part of the Soviet Union, which got about a 34% increase in investment. But this number was only 16% in Central Asia. So Central Asia was bringing down the, the mean increase in investment. By 1985, they were looking worse. Investment in Central Asia dropped by about 1.5% compared to a union-wide rise of 3%. So everybody else was having more investment in the mid-1980s, and Central Asia's share of investment was actually falling. And there were two reasons for this. Uh, one, Moscow was beginning to look for payoffs. In other words, they were looking for things that were economically viable, and they were trying to invest 
um, not for simply merely political reasons, but also in order to get dividends. And the second and probably the most important was really the cotton scandal. Central Asia proved that it was not a dependable partner um, because it was seen as corrupt. <clears throat> The fact that investment in Central Asia was historically based in agriculture meant that industrial development was minimal, but it was found, especially in Kazakhstan and to a lesser extent in Uzbekistan. The central theme in the economy, though, was there was little concern about the amount of inputs. They were all free or heavily subsidized by the state. What you needed was high output. So for any factory, forget about what the inputs are. We're going to tell you what your output is going to be. Um, fertilizers and chemicals in agriculture. Um, in industry, you had energy inefficiency produced by unambitiously polluting power plants, um, horribly outdated technology. Anytime you would have uh, problems with the production facilities, you, they basically put band-aids on them instead of actually updating them and trying to deal with them. And this led to major water pollution, major air pollution. What they did produce in Central Asia tended to be very specified. At best, Kyrgyzstan produces washing machines. But if you're in Kyrgyzstan and need a dryer, you got to go buy one from abroad after independence. There's not one dryer manufacturer. Not one. The only place that might be spared this fate would be Kazakhstan, the most heavily industrialized. Half the workforce in Kazakhstan was employed in industry, trade, or other non-agricultural spheres. And then second to that would be Uzbekistan, though industrialization was much more limited to the World War II period and some follow-up after that. Um, and the follow-up was, uh, was again, based on uh, especially, uh, what did they produce, engines? So parts for the, um, for the airline industry. <clears throat> now, in terms of resources, 85% of Central Asia's oil reserves are in Kazakhstan, which was also a major source of coal in the USSR. 43% of the region's gas reserves are in Turkmenistan. But all this is futile if you have nowhere to sell it. So in the Soviet Union, the state managed the economic relations, which were basically trades between republics. You, Central, you Turkmenistan, give us your natural gas. We, Ukraine, will give you our wheat. They, Georgia, will give you their flowers, etc., etc. The state also managed external trade relations, so that all hard currency profits, hard currency profits, went straight to Moscow and were then divvied up and then redistributed out to the various republics. With independence, Central Asia suddenly needs a way to get its oil and gas to market via pipelines which all go through Russia. And first you need to refine it. And where did the Kazakhs go to refine oil? Well, not to their own refineries. Their own re they had refineries, but they only dealt with Siberian oil, which was a different quality of oil. Again, the idea being to hold these republics to one another, hold them together. Um, so they didn't have refineries. They, they could deal with their own oil, the quality of oil that they had, so they sent it to other republics. It was like two trains passing in the night. This was all about interdependence. The market ties were all about interdependence, making sure the Soviet Union would survive. And of course it didn't. So all this goes back to specialization. Central Asia was used for raw materials, which are particularly vulnerable to world market fluctuations. Take this and add transportation problems, getting the goods to market, and you see very limited opportunities upon independence. I'm going to take a separate set of slides in just a second.